on uh, on native language. I think what people come here is not because I have anything intelligent to say or science to impart, but because they're hoping there'll be some esoteric humor to escape my lips during the course of it. So for this year's effort, I look for inspiration from my new president, who is nice enough to hang a picture of my namesake, Andrew Jackson, though. <laughs> his motivation for doing so is probably best to go unexplored, but having Jackson in my voice is probably good. I'm not sure if I'm related to Andrew. He was a tactless southerner, which <laughs> but the side show today is going to be turning to the Twitterverse. Now that that's our new reality, everything outside the Twitter world is either all the or fake news. We want to learn about how we're doing it, communicating the importance of search and search conservation, the place to look is Twitter. What's the impact of Twitter? So during the course of this talk, keep an eye for little symbols and all that. Just to give you a sampling of what people say on hashtag search and Twitter over the last so. so Lisa got her new lake surge in the New York State. Very abundant in the Great Lakes in the old days before the fishery started up. In the Oneida system, the Finger Lakes and the Oswego River watershed, they were well known in Oswego Falls at the outlet of our, our watershed. Once people traveled through the area, the early explorers, three pre settlement in 1700, did not yet very much about surgeon further inland, but the minute they got to the Falls of Oswego, they started talking a great length about the so they heard quite an important picture here. Most of these figures are, of course, from papers that Carl learned some time ago. There are scattered records of surgeon from the Finger Lakes and Oswego River system. Doug did not uncover any Oneida records, but we are part of the system, and as it turns out, you missed the Oneida Lake Bulletin, which is a, a well-respected academic and scholarly journal put out in a while. My joke on this is that apparently in the summer of 1973, the Grateful Dead were not on tour. <laughs> <laughs> These two young men to take a day's fishing trip on Oneida Lake where they call the Sturgeon, so we know Sturgeon can get into Oneida Lake. On occasion, there's, I think, maybe a dozen, not many more records through the years of Sturgeon and Oneida Lake. From all this, I think, most of the records from Finger Lakes and Oneida Lake post the canal. I think that Oswego Falls was an obstruction for their movement. I don't believe that we ever harbored reproducing or healthy population surgeons upstream and on Lake. Finger Lakes, there's some debate about whether there might have been population in Peter that could reproduce. But nonetheless, they're within a watershed with no population here. Historically, from the canal, that's been a little easier for them to get back and forth. But 1995, as part of the sort of restoration programs over in New York State, as we talked about, Oneida Lake was included in the stockings. Fish taken, I think the first egg take was from somewhere in Quebec, subsequently all from the St. Lawrence River, and stocked from 1995 on. From the first slug of stockings from 95 to 2004, roughly 8,000 or so fish stocked into Oneida Lake. A huge dominant stocking of ultimately 5,007 fish, some stocked as early as some stocked as age four. Up through 1995, 2014, after the VHS crisis was appropriately dealt with, the stocking program was reinitiated in 500 fish scales. So I'll have a kind of running timeline to give you an idea of what we're learning. I'm going to retread stuff you've heard before. The most intensive search mark we did was quite some time ago, now we're just kind of monitoring at a very low level. But when I put this talk together yesterday afternoon, I realized I'd forgotten about the stuff I talked about 10 years ago. Hopefully you got two, so we'll see the fresh and brand new excited. <laughs> but the stocking started in 1995. As of this year, we've caught somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,000 fish in our sampling, either directed or incidental captures in other years. It took some adjustment to learn how to work with sturgeon. This is a, a program that was built around studying walleye and largemouth bass, rather small fish. Our boats were undersized for the size of fish we were encountering the sturgeon, so we, we immediately upgraded what we were going after them with, and that made life a whole lot easier. You can see how well these fish are growing, so big, but they did become critical. 
unlike a lot of folks, we've been quite lucky. We didn't have to work that hard to figure out how to catch them. They started turning up in our walleye gill nets pretty much immediately after stocking. Hit the water in the fall, our nets hit the water the next summer, and the sturgeon hit our nets then. So we started catching them pretty much the day in late without going through any additional heartache or effort. The walleye nets are variable mesh from one and a half to four inches, so we catch the H1s through four or five pretty successfully there. We did add six to 12 inch mesh nets later on for, for the larger sturgeon <coughs> that we catch in there. So we've been very fortunate that its gill net sets are, are quite effective for me. So we're going to get our hands on a lot of fish without a whole lot of exploration on how to do it. In 2002 to 2004, the <laughs> Chester Generosity Cornell gave us some money that we could do some studies with rather than the BC. And we did a three year fairly intensive sturgeon study. But those funds, those are actually my startup funds when I was hired. And we use those to try to figure out a little bit more about what was going on with sturgeon. Tom Brooking, whose name you've heard quite a bit today, and Tony Vanderbilt have been keeping up with sturgeon until I arrived, and then with this little extra cost of money, we're able to, to build a little bit on what we had to. Our initial goal was just to set the, the larger mesh nets through various habitats and like try to get an idea of where the, where the fish were, what habitats they preferred. So we had 12 sites, three each, and four different substrate types. We set them monthly from May through September. These are just four hour sets. We set them right before coffee break and then not right after lunch. So we schedule them pretty conveniently around those times of day when we actually are active doing something other than sitting in the break room. And we did that for three years from 02 to 04. Our findings were that they appeared to prefer sand and shell substrates, the hard substrates or the soft substrates. Statistically, Using repeated measures, we can say that sand was preferred over silt for a month, no other differences amongst the other habitats. And these are, keep in mind, sub adults. These are going to be fish that are what, seven years to nine years or so old, so these aren't bigger fish, these are the smaller sub adults. Those habitat preferences seem to be, seem to be driven primarily by a couple of sites. We had one sand site in the northwest corner of the lake that's a huge catch, pretty reliably. One shoal site in the southeast end of the lake that's a huge catch for a lot of The soft substrate catches are actually a little bit more consistent, but very low. So a little bit of caution should be perfect. They love sand. They love one sandy site. And they love one shoal site, but they didn't love all sand or all the shoals. While we were collecting all these fish, we thought we'd get some diet information. We had to provide, like everybody does. And what we're seeing in the diet is slightly different from what you're in the literature. Chronomids and leaf keys were not are not dominant, and amphipods and zebra mussels, as it turns out, are the most important. Now, that's fish that develop with water mussels. My guess is our fish do suck up bed gizzard shad, like bronze do, but we don't do sampling in the lake when it comes, so we have no roughly idea if that's true, but it's fun to say. And I think the we also can take this much to work, so I can find out for sure. We now have brown gobies, the surgeon are eating those, the small surgeon are eating, so that's going to be a new element of diversity for their, for their diets. The smallest folks were eating amphipods. Once they got to 900 or so millimeters, they started eating zebra mussels, and you can see that that persists. There's at least one book out there that said we're the first people to see that. I doubt that's true. The first people to, to write it and you can get it out there. I'm sure other people have seen it, but it's you know it's a nice little irony that we have a, a native species being restored who's, who's eaten up a, an exotic species. And this is just a zebra bottom mussels now because they can completely displace the zebra mussels. We were also interested in where the food availability was. We started using the traditional conar. We also did a homemade benthic sled. We compared what those two told us about what was available to surgeon. We think we prefer the sled and samples to upper level levels of the sediment where the surgeon are actually feeding. It doesn't dig down six or seven inches where the surgeon is not feeding. So we, we ultimately relied on the sled samples for what was available for food. And this simply compares the proportion of different food groups frequency currents in the sturgeon diets and then four different substrates. So the sturgeon data are the same in all, all the graphs. And you can see the agreement between the sand composition of invertebrates and foods. The sturgeon diets looks like a model, not like actual data. And these aren't driven by the fact that we caught more sturgeon in the sand. That's what they're done. So a lot of these sites came from the walleye nets, which are not in the same habitat. That's where we get the fish as early night sets and diet data generally stronger from those. But it doesn't seem to be a big mystery why the fish are typically found on sand because the foods they obviously prefer at these sizes are more available in the sand and less so in the soft substrates. So we thought we had a pretty good idea where they'd like to be and why they were different and felt pretty good about ourselves. 
Also, during the course of this study, we found right running males in age eight, and something sampling pretty much all the age eight males we encountered are right in, in May and June, so they're maturing fairly early. And because we were sampling so intensively for three years, I thought it might be fun to see if we could use more capture techniques to see if we could estimate the population size. But in this case, not the population size, but how many fish in that first big 1995 stocking were in the lake at the time we were sampling. So that's 5,000 fish. We have a lot of tags out and a lot of recaptures. The other stocks are too small to get those kind of data. <coughs> Unfortunately, this is a not just a simple mark recapture Chapman model. It requires use of program mark from open entry. Mark is slightly over my head in terms of its sophistication and the requirements for mathematical fluency. But I put the numbers in and it gave me numbers back. <laughs> <laughs> and what it said was in, in 2002, when we just used those three years of data, we had about 1,184 of fish in that 1995 stocking so late. So at age seven, some 25% of those fish were still in the lake. That's pretty good survival. I grew up assessing stockings with largemouth bass. If you stock finger in largemouth bass and go back out two months later and 2% of them are still alive, that's a great stock. So to have a fish species who stock that 25% are still there or seven years later is pretty phenomenal. We continued to do the old mass. And Mark continued to give me numbers back when I gave it numbers in. So I went ahead and ran that same model and added another three years of data. Bumped up the estimate for how many fish are out there a little bit. More importantly, it closed the conference a little bit, or comes a lot. It's, it's great to say, oh, there's 2,000 fish out there if you don't commit, but that's plus or minus 2,500. So ultimately, what we have is several different ways to try to estimate the survival of that, that stocking. Traditional Chapman approach on the first two lines, the first one about 24% survival through age seven. The second one, which is the highest number, is the one that is the most egregious in its violation of the assumptions of all recapture studies, <coughs> because it's combining two years of tag and one of your recaptures. I think that's pretty unreliable, but the event anybody wants to say half to survive, that's how you get that number. And then two program mark efforts to show about 25, 36%. So those are fairly consistent, 25 and 36% survival seven years later. Again, I think that's outstanding for stock fish in the lake that long. Bearing in mind that this dawn talk about, we have out migration. So the model is suggesting about 10% annual mortality. That agrees very well with catch curves. We know fish are leaving the lake, so we're not having a 10% die every year. We have a bunch of leaving. So I think the stocking success and survival is quite good. And the program is, we think, quite successful in stocking working. Survival is excellent. Whatever survival is, it seems to be pretty consistent from one stocking year to the next. These graphs for those 2002 to 2004 years compare at the time we were setting the nets, the proportion of each stock year class that we think was available to the gear, and the proportion that we caught in the year. And you can see, again, excellent agreement. <coughs> we caught fish in roughly the proportion we'd expect, assuming that all year classes survived equally. And this is important to note because one of those stockings was stocked as yearlings at about twice the size of the other fish, which at least based on one sample size, which is more than enough to make management recommendations from. <laughs> stocking as yearlings doesn't seem to prefer much advantage over stocking for seven years. Now we're just continuing to monitor the fish. We don't have, have the resources or time right now given our, our real commitments under the contract to, to do anything like that. So we set nets in the spring, every May and every June, to monitor drum, carp, and sturgeon, and other big fish that we don't catch the walleye nets. Catches bounce around all over the place. For a while, it looked like we were going to say, well, the catches are declining because I hadn't stocked fish since 2004, that they popped up for reasons we don't understand. There is no rhyme or reason that variability other than the catches are quite variable. What most likely drives our success is when we fit this sampling into those other sampling activities we do that are, are more important and more sensitive to time. If it's a hot year or hot spring, we either late, catches are low, we either have virus or refill catches are pretty high. But the take home here is there's still fish out there and there's still quite a few. Their growth is outstanding. We use fin rays, caught our first 100 pound fish last year, so this will be a 21 year old fish that hit 100 pounds. I knew Ron would be here, so I thought I would do this comparison. This is from Ron's 2009 paper using the Oakless. And, and I, Ron and I 
been in the same session a fair number of times. When I first started saying our fish are outgrowing your fish, you said that we weren't using the right data. But then you post your dissertation. And, you know, I think we have an edge because they're stopped from a hatchery digger. So we get a, a jump right out of the gate that is probably unfair. But statistically, at least back when I ran these before I left my, my jump stamp software license expired, <laughs> they were growing statistically faster as well. But our fish, regardless of comparisons, are doing quite well in crowd of their sizes. Other populations with good information are mostly the Great Lakes populations that didn't compare favorably, Lake Lower Niagara, Lake St. Francis, Lake Champlain, and the Erie have comparable growth rates to what we're seeing. They gain weight as they get longer. We're pretty excited to find that out. <laughs> Our growth coefficient is only about 2.4, 2.5, which is on the, the lethal range of Carlander reports. I don't know if that means our fish are underweight. Carlander didn't have that much data. But early on, we were like 3.3, 3.4. Now that's going down, so I'm not sure what that means. They certainly look healthy when they can. This is Ron's slide. Years ago, I invited Ron to talk in a session in Wisconsin on history, and I enjoyed his talk, but my main motivation was to get a hold of his slides. <laughs> and I've been using quite a few of them for years, but knowing he'd be here, I only used this one, I think, this year, so it wouldn't be quite as obvious. But to make the point, the fish are, are pretty late in terms of maturing. Again, we commented we had males returning at age eight. It's dawn pointed in 2012, we got the first ripe female, so that would be at age 17, so that's quite early. And then a couple, three years ago, 2013, we caught our first wild produced surf, and we know it's wild, there hadn't been stocking in nearly enough years, so there's really nothing, nothing else it could be. It was aged and hatched in 2011, which means it's produced by a 16 year old female. So we have 16 year old females, 8 year old females out there spawning. And at least that one time, they produced one fish that survived at age 2. We have caught some more young fish last year. It was a kind of dry spell in 2013, I believe. The governor issued a press release about that 2013 fish. There's some expectation we'd just be reporting about successful spawning and reproduction, the survival of the fish, and not from there henceforward. But we had a couple years with nothing. Then last year we, we caught a few more. We caught one very small fish that aged back to 2012. And then we caught some middling sized fish, or middling fish that went back to 2012, and some more small fish, nine of them, which date to age two to 2014, which is a stocking, which is, I've told Lisa, that ideally, <laughs> regardless of whatever their, their wacky management goals were, they wouldn't put more fish on ice, so we wouldn't be stuck trying to figure out whether we had hatchery fish or wild fish in the summer increase. And we double tag all the fish in the hatchery with pit tags and coated water tags. Number <coughs> nine fish we caught. Seven had tags and two had no tags. I find it unreasonable to think that every fish that lost a pit tag would also lose its code water tag or vice versa. So we were only able to conclude that two of those fish were wild produced, which means we now think we've had three years with successful reproduction in this population. And it's tempting if you catch one fish here and one fish here, you say, well, how many fish are these are being produced out there? And great numbers to work with, very tight range in terms of how many you catch to age two. Now, while I net, they figure you know, they stock 5,000, we caught 33. That's the usual way to estimate what catching one is. But the range of numbers is from zero to 0.13, so that's pretty, pretty tough to try to make a model from. Except the regression looks beautiful, it's a point, point nine. So, this is a, if you've ever been told that you produced a dumbbell regression, this is exactly what we're talking about. The noise at those lower stocking numbers is deafening. The variability predictions is huge, but we have that one big stocking with 33 catch and anchors regression. We get a great R squared. We say, look at this model. And if I was talking to an, an academic audience, I'd be bragging about it, but for you all admit that I think any prediction from that model is pretty weak. So all we know is if we catch one while produced fish, it might mean anything from you know 70 something and 200 something individuals out there. The model would say 200 would change. Last year's catch seven hatchery or seven fish from the hatchery, two not from the hatchery. That's more interesting to say we can do something to that. That indicates that 22 percent of the fish out there are wild, which would mean that we got 111 wild fish produced there. 
I tried running the Chapman. I'm going to get a little gear help on this because there, I know there's lots of people out here who are I ran a Chapman model on this because it makes sense. We had tag fish, we caught some fish, we had recaptures. You run that, it says there's 1,300 wild fish out there, which is just off the charts, I think. And I think there's something inherently wrong. So we didn't take the fish we tagged out of the population and put them back. We took the fish from completely out of the system, tagged them, and put them in there. That's my best guess for why those numbers are so out of reach because you got two proportions they should be a lot closer than they're just not. If someone can help me understand why the Chapman model is giving me the wrong answer, I appreciate it. If they can convince me it's giving me the right answer, DC will appreciate it because that means the reproduction is way more. I mean, 1,300 fish produced is way better than 111. Anyway, they're producing fairly small numbers and we probably shouldn't expect there to be a whole lot more. Remember, these fish are young. Females don't spawn every year. It, it could be a very tiny population of spawners out there and they're cranking out couple hundred fish a year, that, that may actually be pretty reasonable. So conclusions. Now I apologized last night to Ron for the graphics on this slide. I grew up in Atlanta. <coughs> moved there the same year the Falcons did. 51 years of pain and agony. So I feel a little bit in my right to celebrate, but I didn't want to hurt Ron's feelings. If anybody else who, who resents the fact that the Packers fell victim to the Falcons March Super Bowl. Tough, but for Ron, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> happy you came here. Don't want to be offensive. So we know there's fish out there. We know they grow pretty well. And they mature pretty early. They're producing some young fish, and some young fish are surviving. What we don't know is precisely where they spawn. They go to Fish Creek, major inlet at the east end. There's enough angling pressure in there. There's angler reports. So we know those fish are there for people to observe them. There are other likely tributaries where they could find places that don't receive the same angling pressure. The odds of hearing about them are up there not as good. I suspect Fish Creek will be the primary spawning run. It'd be nice to find out precisely where they go so we can assess the quality of the spawning habitat and whether the Texas larvae are surviving in the super race. All we know now is that some are getting out, but we don't know whether or not they're a reasonable representation of what's what could be getting out if we had the right conditions up there. And finally, my take home is, if we're trying to advance the cause of sturgeon conservation through Twitter, which most of the world apparently uses now instead of news, we're in trouble. Because Nicholas Sturgeon, who I don't know, I didn't know anything about this, leader of Scotland, Scotland voted to stay in the EU, UK voted to get the heck out of the EU, and Nicholas making a lot of racket about voting for independence of Scotland from the UK so they can stay in the EU or staying in the UK but not having any compromise in their EU negotiations. They just inspired me to rowdy Twitter first feedback, almost like our last election. But it was quite competitive. So until she's flushed out of office and there's no other world leaders who are controversial with the last name Surgeon, hashtag Surgeon is not going to get us very far. <laughs> <laughs> the stuff's there, but it is, you have to think pretty hard to find it. And that's really all I have today.